if you want to have a collaborative environment, you better trust your people enough to share information with you. Business of Architecture, episode 328. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears. This is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for building an architecture practice that lets you do your best work more often. Today's episode is sponsored by Smart Practices, Business of Architecture's step-by-step -step business training program for architects that shows you how to structure your practice so you can focus on doing your best work instead of being bogged down in the complexity of running a business. Build the business you need to do the work that you want. Discover more by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart. That's S-M-A-R-T. Today is the second half of my interview with former CEO of the engineering and architecture firm HOK, Patrick McLamey. Patrick McLamey led the firm as CEO from the year 2003 to 2016, which culminated a 50 plus year working at HOK, an incredible, incredible story. McLamey just released a book on his experience in leadership and business through his time at HOK, and you can find that book by searching Amazon for Designing a World-Class Architecture Firm, The People, Stories, and Strategies Behind HOK. Or you can hop over to the Business of Architecture website, and you can find all this information here in the show notes. McLamey is also the chairman of Building Smart International, which works to achieve open standards for the exchange of digital information in the building and infrastructure industries. He was a founding member of Building Smart in 1994. During his 50 years at HOK, the firm grew into one of the largest architecture and engineering firms in the world. McLamey himself ro rose from junior designer at HOK to CEO and witnessed the firm's growth from a single Midwestern office to 27 locations across the globe, offering architecture, interiors, engineering, planning, and more. McLamey joined HOK in St. Louis in 1967, after which he was sent out to help establish the firm's San Francisco office, which he later became the managing principal of. He joined HOK's executive committee in 1995 and was named the chief operating officer five years later. In 2003, he was elected chief executive officer, and he held that position for 13 years after retiring retiring, shall we say, or as he likes to say, repurposing in 2017. In this episode of the Business of Architecture podcast, McLemy goes on to talk about the critical challenges that he faced. He calls them crises that happened immediately upon his, his tenure and his, his assuming the position as CEO of the firm, how he dealt with these and how he had took on the incredible task of making a shift in the direction of the culture at HOK. No doubt an invaluable interview. I hope you get lots of valuable information out of our conversation today. Hello, Patrick McLamey, and welcome back to the Business of Architecture podcast. Thank you very much. Now, you mentioned at the end of our last interview, you were starting to talk about your transition when you inherited uh, the position of CEO and that that was a, a risky and a difficult time you described it as a crisis. Let's talk about that. Tell me about the story of what happened when you assumed leadership as the CEO and what was the crisis you were dealing with and how did yes, you deal okay. with it? Um, well, uh, I became the CEO in 2003, probably at the most difficult, challenging times for the company since its founding. Mm. Uh, and uh, the expansion and growth that HOK had enjoyed in all the years of our existence since 1955 had covered up a lot of disarray in individual offices and covered up a lot of um, tension and, and competition between offices. That is, if somebody wasn't doing a great job in an office and losing a little money, that didn't matter that much because the firm was growing and growth covers up all sins. So as long as you're growing, uh, that's fine. But in 2002, we stopped growing temporarily. And we started to see all these problems crop up with uh, not only people not collaborating properly, but the end result was we weren't making much money. And the money that we did make as a firm 
uh, wasn't being collected on time. And cash flow, everybody who runs a business needs to understand about cash flow. Cash flow becomes paramount. Uh, my, my, uh, my, one of my HOK friends used to say, you know what the golden rule is? What's that? He who has the gold makes the rule. That's the golden rule. We need cash. We need cash. It's like oxygen to a firm. So when I became CEO in 2003, we had not one crisis having to do with cash. We had three crises. Um, it happened this way. Just before I became CEO, we called on um, an investor. It's a longer story, and I'll try to make it brief. HOK for a period of about 15 years had an investor, a Japanese contractor, Kajima Corporation, headquartered in Tokyo. Really nice people, fantastic people. They invested in some HOK stock. Only the only ever outsiders that held HOK stock. We had to change our bylaws to allow them to do this, to give us more cash to grow faster under my predecessor. His 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 uh, strategy was. We needed to be much larger to compete properly with the big firms around the world. And we did grow, but we grew without quality throughout. So uh, I had gone to the, to, the, uh, to the Kojima offices in New York City, and they said, look, we have HOK stock and we're patient, uh, but we expected your stock to grow and it's not growing. Because our stock, if you have a company like ours, Stock is not based in a stock market, what somebody thinks it's worth. Stock, stock is prices based on profit and loss. If you're making profits and retaining it, your, your stock goes up. If you're making losses, the stock goes down. So they said, you know, the stock has been almost static here for the last several years. And yet we see that every year you give away a substantial part of the meager profit you make in bonuses to yourselves and to your staff. Well, we're not employees, so we're not getting a bonus. That's not fair. We think you should start giving us an annual dividend. And if you don't, then we think we're going to, in, in accordance with our um, agreement with HOK, we're going to immediately take action to sell our stock back to HOK and demand immediate repayment. And we did not have the money. So that was crisis number one. We had an unhappy investor that wanted something to happen right away. They wanted, they wanted money on an annual basis in a dividend fashion if we couldn't get the stock to grow or else. We walked out of that meeting in New York City. There's two crises happened at the same day. Walked out of that meeting, uh, the, the president, my, they were my CFO, the president of HOK, which is the, was the designer, Bill Valentine, and I, we said, oh, boy, we got to, let's get a cup of coffee across the street and talk about this. So we were in some... Yeah, you didn't go straight to the bar? I mean, I would have thought, let's, let's, go to, let's get some hard liquor <laughs> and discuss this. It's a very sobering experience to have that meeting. So we went to a restaurant and ordered coffee, and we were sitting at this table. It was a rather noisy restaurant, at the three of us. And uh, we got a call from HOK's controller, which is the person directly under the CFO. Controller says, um, I got a call from the bank and they're insisting that they talk to you today, now. So he said, I'm going to patch you through. So there we were in a noisy restaurant trying to listen on cell phones and the bank came on. This was, uh, what's the bank have to do? Well, the bank, we had a, we had a relationship with uh, Bank of America and we had a credit facility with the bank, which means we had a line of credit where we could borrow money from the bank uh, if our cash flow was too slow and we could pay it back uh, with, uh, with interest and so on. Well, uh, when you borrow money from a bank, in case nobody, and I'm sure all your listeners know this, it always comes with strings attached. And in the big borrowing world, it's called bank covenants. You have to have certain cash flow. You have to have certain collection ratios. And, uh, we were in violation of all the bank covenants. Every last one, I think there were eight covenants. Um, and so the bankers basically gave us a raking over the coals of, okay, um, 
you're, you're maxed out on your line of credit. That's, that's the other thing I left out. We had a line of credit with the bank where it allowed us to borrow to make payroll and so on. Mm -hmm. That was all the way to the limits. We couldn't borrow anymore on the line of credit. And it was in the millions, and I won't tell you how much, but it was a big number. We had just had our, just across the street, just had our main investor say, you're not doing it for us, and we're going to either pay, pay us the money or, or, or else. Then we had the bank saying, if you don't comply with these covenants, we're going we're gonna to have to cut off your line. And what's more, if it gets any worse, we're going to call the line. Calling the line of credit is basically driving us to bankruptcy because they're saying, pay us back the money today, which we didn't have that money. So we had two big financial crises because we weren't profitable and because we hadn't managed our cash flow, but we collected on time. Those are the two big immediate problems. So welcome to being a CEO. The third one was uh, longer term, but actually turned out to be the longest term to solve, which was that the HOK culture that I talked about, uh, where there's collaboration inside in order to compete outside. The collaboration inside had broken down between offices and groups, not everywhere in the firm, but many places in the firm. And without that collaboration and cooperation, how are we ever going to get out of these cash flow problems? Mm -hmm. So those are the three things that I confronted as the brand new CEO. Um, <laughs> I will tell you that um, I thought for a couple of, for for several days about when I got the new job. Oh my! I you know when you get to be a CEO, you hope that you're able to set your own agenda. My agenda was set for me. Uh, I had to respond to those crises. The two immediate ones were the bank and the investor. Um, I met with the bank a number of times um, and met with the investor again and basically got some time. That's the right now we're in a coronavirus. You know, your clients are saying, I'm going to have to stop work. Your, mm -hmm. your employees are saying, gee, are you going to pay me? What you need is some more time, a little bit of time to work this out. So I was able to get some time. Don't be afraid to ask for time if you're in that situation. Maybe ask for more time to pay your rent or, uh, or pay that vendor that, uh, that supplies things to you, or maybe even your consultants. Try not to do that with your employees, however. They're human beings and they have to eat. So um, it took, um, I, I told the bank, um, give me three months and we'll begin to pay off the loan. I can't tell you how much we'll pay, but we'll pay you something every month, three months out. I didn't know that we could do that, but I thought we, we had no choice but to do that. I called the leaders of the firm together. This is a longer story. There's a great chapter in my book about it. Called the leaders of the firm together, our board of directors, 30 of us, basically people who led offices and people who led um, market practices like healthcare and justice and aviation specialists, but who run those groups. And I said, these problems are caused by us and they can be solved by us working together. So the first thing I, I'm asking all of you is to join together as a board and when I call it the strong board, where the strong board needs to have mutual commitments one to the other that we're gonna attack these problems one at a time until they're all solved. And I got the collaboration of the, and the cooperation of the board. I will say that later with a couple of, uh, couple of the board members in the most recalcitrant offices, the least cooperative offices had to be removed. But, and actually that's another good lesson. If you remove one that's been standing up and saying, I'm not gonna do this, if that person is removed, even, even though other people stand up and say, they take notice, oh, you mean what you say. So um, we began to demand um, from each office, and, and in HOK, each office does its own billing and collecting of fees. There's a central accounting function that consolidates all the money and makes the payroll and so on, but uh, every office is responsible for its own collections. 
So we instituted monthly board meetings. Had never done that before. Virtual on web apps like we're using today. And the the, the board meetings, uh, we we found a way to compare office by office how their collections were. Put some very simple metrics. Are you collecting your fees? And uh, uh, the offices began to have, it began then to see, oh, Office A is doing a great job and Office B is not. I'll just say St. Louis is doing a fantastic job, but those, those guys in New York, they just weren't collecting that money. So uh, there was positive peer pressure. Let's help collect money. We were making profits, not, not great robust profits, but if you don't collect it, you never earn it. Um, the, the controller, the same one that called us to the meeting with the bank and with her cell phones, had a sign on his desk that said, accrual is an, is an opinion, cash is a fact. <laughs> for those of probably every architect out there uses an accrual system for deciding how much you earned. How many hours did I work? How many drawings did I do? Whatever it is. But it actually doesn't mean anything unless you collect it. Once you've collected it, it's a fact. So our collections began to improve in the second month. And then the third month, at the end of the month, uh, our CEO, CFO, pardon me, hand carried a rather modest payment to the bank. We had continued to make interest payments, but they were interested in repayment of some of that principal. And every single month thereafter, he didn't carry it by hand after that, but they began to, uh, we began to make steady payments to the bank and it took us three years to pay that line of credit down all the way to zero. And the banker had been, the banker that I dealt with personally was so, uh, I think unprofessional to me personally. He was a guy half my age um, who didn't know uh, architecture from the planet Neptune and uh, just gave me a little lecture. Didn't actually practice what I what I wanted to do, which is leadership, was sit down with me and what are, what are the issues that you're facing and maybe we can help or let's start. The, it was just, I need the money and I need it now kind of thing. So once we began to pay the line off, uh, he began to invite my CFO to lunch. I said, Bob, don't go to lunch with him. Just continue to make monthly payments. When we paid off the line, he invited both of us to lunch. He said, congratulations. Let's go have a celebratory lunch. I said, Bob, go look for a new bank, which is what we did. We yeah. switched banks because the bank had treated us like crap mm -hmm. instead of as the professionals that we wanted to be. It took three years. Um, we paid off the investor, the same thing. We did make some dividend payments to them, but once your cash flow is improved because you're collecting regularly, and it wasn't just collecting, it was getting offices aligned about making the profits on the accrual side and then collecting. So we worked at this hard. Uh, every 30 days, there was a reckoning. But we began to pay our investor. We No, we didn't pay our investor in pieces. Uh, we waited until we had enough money. After, after we paid off the bank, we got a new bank. We continued to make regular payments to the new bank into a strategic reserve fund. What a great thing to have money in the bank. We used that strategic reserve fund in a number of ways over the years, including once we had enough money in it, uh, we could sit down with Kojima. We had a nice meeting in Santa Monica in a beautiful office there overlooking the Pacific Ocean. And uh, would you like us to buy you back out again? Yes, we would. But then Kojima uh, was uh, in Japan. Japan was in a recession. Kojima needed money. So yes, we would. We agreed on a price and, and did a handshake, agreed to pay them in 30 days, which we did. Um, so there's nothing more wonderful than having cash instead of debt. So those two big problems took, I think, uh, by, without peeking in the book, I think the bank was three years and I think Kojima was on the fifth year. Getting the culture of HOK aligned you know, can, can I pause you there for a second, Patrick? Yeah. So our, our listeners may be thinking, okay, 
they just heard a horror story about debt. I'm not going to touch debt with a 10 foot pole. Do you think debt is a useful tool for a business? And, and if so, how, how should it be used? Yes, of course. Especially for small firms, your perspective on smaller firms that may need that. I, I think it is, but you have to, you have to treat it with the respect it, it deserves. Uh, it's not a piggy bank to be just arbitrarily robbed. It's, it is, uh, something that you use on rainy days like right now with the coronavirus is a great time to have a line of credit every big company out there has used up their line of credit to stay afloat during the coronavirus if you're a small firm wouldn't it be great to have a bank uh, line of credit handy ready for you to dip into to make payroll or pay the monthly rent or what have you so yes you should use debt as a strategic tool you just should not get uh, uh, in, enslaved by it. It's a lot like using a credit card. You know, if you're one of those people who doesn't pay off your credit cards every month, you probably should do that first before you think about getting a line of credit for your business. But it's a perfectly good tool. You just have to respect it and treat it with, uh, with that kind of respect. Now. So you, you handled the financial, that was, that was no small task. And we can, we can finish up here. Tell me about the cultural aspect. And you understandably said this was a much longer project. Yeah. How do you shift the culture of an organization that spans multiple nations that has <coughs> hundreds, <coughs> thousands of employees? Uh, that was the hardest and took the longest time. Um, First of all, we you can't communicate enough, uh, including in person. I visited every single office at least once a year, most of them twice. And every time I visited an office, I made sure that I took the time to meet with an all staff meeting. I wouldn't just meet with the leaders of the office. I did that too, but I met with all the employees because they wanted to they wanted to see who I was. I wanted to see who they were and uh, getting employees to ask questions can tell me volumes about how an office is doing. Uh, if offices, if I walk into an office and it's unnaturally quiet, there's probably something going on with the leadership that's a little too much like management. Uh, I had one occasion where I went to Toronto to our Canadian office and I had the, had the usual office meeting all the employees were there and I gave a little talk about the state of the firm and what was going on and then said, now, are there any questions? Not a word. Everybody was afraid to ask that first question. We needed an icebreaker. So I had a Canadian uh, $1 coin in my pocket, which was called a loonie. You know about that loonie and toonie? The $2 coin is, <laughs> anyway. I pulled a loony out of my pocket. I said, okay, the first person to ask a question is going to get this. And finally, one young woman plucked up her courage and asked me a very vanilla question that, uh, you know, was, do you think the sky is blue or something like that? I gave her the loony. I answered her question honestly. I said, there are no bad questions. Then a young man put his head up. He said, if I ask a question, will I get a loony too? I said, well, no, you wouldn't because that was just that one time, but I'd love to have your question. Well, then it was as if the dam broke. When people are asking questions, those are teaching moments. They want to know things. They haven't been informed about what's going on in the firm. They're afraid. They think that maybe if they speak up or put their head up, they'll be noticed too much and they'll be laid off or fired or something. So. Uh, talking to everybody, communicating, and telling people endlessly um, about everything. I opened the books of our firm up to everybody. Open book. Uh, everybody knew every month what was going on in the firm, which offices were making money, which were losing, how much the overall firm was making, what our collections were, what our backlog of new work, everything. Um, most firms do not do that. If you want to have a collaborative environment, you better trust your people enough to share information with you. Uh, the other thing we did is we changed our bonus 
protocol. Uh, it was as the office, as HOK grew and there were multiple offices, the bonuses that many firms give out at the end of every uh, fiscal year, HOK was no different, but we used a mathematical formula. If you were a profitable office and you made your office contributed 10% to the profits, you got 10% of the bonus pool. If you if you made uh, 5% of the profits, you got 5%, et cetera. That wasn't right because it, it, it drove the offices, the, the incentives were wrong. It was all about profits. It wasn't about collaboration. It wasn't about sharing staff. It wasn't about helping each other. Um, it was all about keeping as much fee in your own office as you could and making as much profit so you can get a big bonus. So we changed it. We changed it for uh, every office leader, um, three to four people in every major office, the, the leaders, managing principal, marketing principal, technical principal, and design principal, and the leaders of the, uh, of the uh, specialties like healthcare and so on. Those were put into their own bonus pool and the XCOM, the executive committee, uh, myself and uh, it, it varied over the years, but three to four other people actually went through that list and decided the bonus for each person based on sure profit, but also are you collaborative? Are you helping other offices to succeed? Are you sharing your key staff person that can help that office that's hurting win that next job, et cetera. And uh, once, we, once we did that, that turned the trick because the incentives were not just making profit at the expense maybe of your colleague offices, but it was the, if, if we all win together, we all win big. So that changed the fortunes of the, the collaboration on the leadership part. Um, it was still a matter of huge amount of communication we also had uh, uh, every few years, we had a firm wide leadership retreat. We couldn't have all 2000 people come, but we had at, at our largest one, I think we had 250 people um, attend at company expense uh, or at a nice resort where people, it was, yes, yeah, coming together to work, but also just having dinner together and bonding and finding out that, you know, that person you didn't think too much of in the office in the next state over is actually a pretty good guy. So um, all of those things, it took us uh, eight years plus to actually get that embedded so that the firm was glued back together again. And HOK culture was, mm -hmm. was not that. Fantastic. So you, you mentioned that you, you went on tour, you spoke to people, you opened up communication. Yep. You changed the incentive style to more uh, encourage collaboration. You had full company retreats to be able to help people relate to each other on a on a human basis, and you really just brought them together as not just trying to keep the profit in their office, but actually collaborate. Yes, and I guess the other, maybe on the, the negative side of that effort, is we had to remove a couple of people who were just adamant, dead set, that they weren't going to do this this way. And um, once those people were removed, and we had big debates about it, let me just say, some of us at this executive committee have a big debate. You know, if we let that person go, they're responsible for getting that biggest job and they've got clients and that office is just gonna collapse if that person is let go. And every single time we let somebody like that go, it was as if there was room now for all these young people to grow and flower we had clients coming back to us saying, you know, I'm glad you did that. I never really did care for that person. And now you've got this new person in place. You're going to get all of our work. We're really happy with HOK. So you have mm -hmm. to be, you, you have to be sparing about it, but you have to be willing to, uh, to take that one person away from this mix. If they're really not part of the HOK culture, if they're really not playing well inside that, the HOK family. And I think that, that that applies to any firm. Patrick, what message would you like to share with architects who are 
wanting to impact the future of the built environment, what suggestions would you have for them about really making a positive change? Oh my, so many things. Um, well, well, I would say first, uh, uh, architecture is a noble profession. We, we have a huge responsibility to shape the environment. I'm sure we all learned that in school. We all know in practice it's so difficult it's a tough place to to do, and sometimes shaping the environment is takes second position to just survival. And uh, uh, I think we have responsibilities as architects to become much, much more successful business-wise. Successful firms actually make things happen, and firms that are struggling don't. That's my experience. So if you if you want to have a great practice. Learn how to make make your practices successful financially and in terms of keeping good people and having that stability of a, of a long run with uh, giving people careers at your firm. Then you'll have more impact. You'll actually do what you dreamed about doing when you were a student. Fantastic. Patrick, thank you for joining us here on the Business of Architecture podcast. It's been my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. And that is a wrap. I hope you had as much fun listening to today's interview as I did actually conducting the interview with Patrick McLamy. What a world of experience and what an incredible opportunity for us to learn from his hard-earned and hard-won business lessons. I hope that you got a lot of value out of our conversation. His book should be required reading for every current and aspiring architecture firm owner. You can find it by searching Amazon for the title of the book, Designing a World-Class Architecture Firm, The People, Stories, and Strategies Behind HOK. Or you can also buy that book directly by going to maclamy.com. That's M-A-C-L-E-A-M-Y.com. I can't recommend it enough. If you haven't already, please leave us a review over on iTunes. I read every one of those comments and your feedback is appreciated. For any recommendations or suggestions for guests you want to hear on the show, write to podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. Today's episode is sponsored by Smart Practices, the world's leading step-by-step business training program for architects that's helped more than 103 architecture firm owners structure their existing practice so the complexity of running a business doesn't get in the way of doing exceptional architecture. Because you see, it isn't your architecture design skills that hold you back. Likely, it's the complexity of running a business, managing people and projects, dealing with clients, contractors, and money. If you're ready to simplify the running of your practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash training to discover the proven, simple, and easy to implement smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way of doing exceptional architecture. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.